four of Coin Geek Weekly Discussions. And I'm very excited that we will be spending the next hour with a superstar special guest who you already see on the stage. He is no stranger to the Bitcoin community. It's Mr. Derek Moore in the house. Welcome, Derek. Happy Friday to you. Very excited to have you on this space. Been looking forward to a conversation with you for quite some time. But first, before we get into it with Derek, Zach, my friend, GM, again, can you please let us all know? Well, first, can you tell us how was your week? And then, of course, most importantly, what is the biggest, most significant news in blockchain this week that people need to know about if they only have five minutes to spend right now? Tell us what they need to walk away uh, from with today about what they missed if they haven't been paying attention. So this week was great for me. Uh, I'm glad to be in 2024. Made some progress in business, made some progress in friendships. But uh, the most interesting event of the week was, I think, the SEC misstep in announcing the Bitcoin BTC ETFs a day early and then calling it a hack. And then Twitter kind of backing them up that it was hacked. But it happened the next day. So either way, the big news is that ETFs are approved. There are 11 of them trading. Bitcoin price has gone down since they opened. Um, but apparently institutions can save Bitcoin now, question mark. Um, biggest news of the week. Can't say I disagree. Uh, that certainly shook up uh, 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 really the whole industry. And it's interesting uh, to see as it develops. We are going to be talking about all that today with Derek Moore and, of course, uh, all of the audience members who want to participate in the conversation. Um, but first, I just want to let everybody know, uh, again, share the space. But uh, if you want to request to get up on the stage, we will do that in the second half of the, of the show. So you can either hit the mic request button on the bottom left uh, now and uh, just be patient until that time, uh, unless you've been a guest on the show before. Otherwise, um, that way uh, you can skip the line. But uh, you can also put your questions in the bottom right and just go ahead and post a comment, uh, share your thoughts, anything you want us to bring up on the show. You can hit the bottom right and we will check the comments and we do our best to get to those. Uh, also, there is a giveaway. Might as well just go ahead and announce that now as a non-fungible token of our appreciation. The traditional 4.20 p.m. giveaway for everyone here live who reposts the space within the first hour. We will randomly select one winner to receive a unique prize, usually a Bitcoin NFT of some kind. So to enter to win, all you have to do is repost the space again. Just hit the bottom right and then you're entered. Once the clock strikes 4.20, we will pause to announce this week's winner but yeah so back to the show gensler's account got hacked or not derek moore we're going to get into it with him derek is a entrepreneur derek is a scientist a technologist a programmer and an engineer he's got tons of valuable insight to share so derek uh, welcome to the show again. Happy Friday. And do you agree with Zach that that's the biggest news of the week in blockchain? I mean, I, I guess you can't disagree with that, right? Yeah, thanks. Happy Friday. I uh, I guess so. I mean, who's that one lady? Elizabeth Warren. She came out all mad about it, that uh, there needs to be more anti-money laundering going on in Bitcoin. Yeah, a lot of people came out mad about it. I was I was debating whether or not saying that we got some like uh, published or publicized news about TerraNode, but uh, I think the misstep was kind of bigger news. All right, well, let's we'll talk about that. But before we do that, uh, let's get to know Derek again uh, a little bit just to start the conversation. Derek, the first question we like to ask. Uh, most of our guests is just tell us uh, how'd you get into Bitcoin and anything you want to share uh, with the audience uh, about yourself. But most importantly, like what's your Bitcoin journey? How did you find out about Bitcoin? I know you're quite the OG. has been around in the space for, for some time. So can, can you give us that backstory? Um, I guess so. Mostly I'm a nobody. 
and Bitcoin's kind of cool because nobody's can get involved in it. Um, I I don't know. Um, I didn't really believe in Bitcoin for a long time because of the uh, you know the way transactions are a directed acyclic graph. So it's like a fully transparent and everyone can see like who's transacting with who. And especially if you're transacting with someone, then it's like, oh, now I know that this is your wallet. Now I can like basically assume like what your financial history is. Because uh, you'd like tagged me on Bitcoin in order to pay me for mowing your lawn. Uh, anyway, so I don't know that like that, the like fully transparent nature of Bitcoin, I thought was disingenuous because all of the activists that were promoting Bitcoin thought that it was um, some kind of a privacy revolution. And it was, in fact, like a tr transparency revolution. So I, I referred to it as a mass surveillance system. And people didn't seem to agree with that terminology. Uh, and they were cypherpunks, and they thought that it was a privacy revolution. Uh, and so I stayed away from it because it looked, uh, you know, the community seemed disingenuous in that regard. And then uh, I guess I became interested in, around the scaling debate and I started thinking about like, I don't know, a friend of mine, Luke Dash Jr. was like, had become by then a, an important Bitcoin developer. So, you know, another nobody became very important to Bitcoin. And um, uh, and I don't know, I became curious in this, uh, I, I used to like, I knew Luke had this anti-spam stance, but I was interested in Bitcoin as a storage system. You know, first of all, it, it stores these financial transactions in a way that's fully transparent. So it's like storing that at least. But then there's these memo fields it, it essentially has. Like, why can't we store there too? And so I would like flirt with Luke with these ideas about like, why are you building a mass surveillance system? And can I store the Bible on there? Uh and we did eventually do that on Bitcoin SV. We uploaded like a 50 megabyte PDF of Luke Dash Jr.'s Bible as an early example of like on-chain spam. Um, the New Testament of the like English translation in France. What's that called? Wait, the, sorry. When you say we, did you did you imply that Luke Dash Jr. was involved in uploading that to BSV? No, but I think since that he has maybe put Bible verses in his memo fields, in his op returns. Maybe he's known for putting Bible verses on BTC. Is that true? Um, I'm not sure. Sorry, true. I didn't mean to divert. I heard that, I heard that rumor about him. Clarify. Uh, no, I did that in honor of him, I guess. Uh, but maybe, you know, I, maybe I said we, because probably people donated to a wallet to afford it. Cause it, I don't know what it cost at the time. Anyway, what were we saying? You're telling us the story of how you came to Bitcoin. And oh, how, yeah. So the uh, scaling debate, I was around scaling. And I, yeah, I kind of want to pick your brain if your magic dap is doing on chain storage. That's, I want, I we sort of are. Trip. But let's get through your introduction first and then we can get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, well, uh, so I don't know. So my, inter I, my interest really peaked in the scaling debate because it's like, well, if this thing is fully transparent, why don't we just like increase the volume and do really cool things with it, such as like permanently store anything, including our financial transactions. Uh, so I don't know. So I, so I kind of watched the scaling debate very closely. Uh, and I thought that, you know, in general, the scaling debate was lost. And I thought Bitcoin cash was uninteresting. And then I realized like a, the scaling debate was happening again in Bitcoin cash and BSV was going to split off and or like memo, there was this like memo um, social network. Memo cash and memo, memo cash SV, social yeah. network. That was impressive. And then, you know, it was cool how that social network like operated on both sides of the split afterwards. But, uh, but I don't know. For me, the Satoshi's vision was like really apparent in the Bitcoin cash split. And, and Bitcoin cash like became an interesting thing because of, you know, Bitcoin SV's proposals. Um, Otherwise, yeah, I don't know. I wasn't, um, I wasn't a Bitcoin casher or a B casher or any of that. Of any of that. Uh, and I wasn't really a Bitcoiner either, except I was like, you know, studying the stuff. And then when BSV started to, you know, when the fork became sort of inevitable, 
I thought, I thought that was apparent before the fork actually happened, that the fork was inevitable. Uh, then I started to like buy the different Bitcoins and try to use them. And, uh, and then when, you know, when BSV actually split, then I decided to start, uh, whatever, looking into like participating in the network or, uh, whatever, being more involved openly or, uh, using issuing transactions or whatever. And then, and then people came up with these, whatever, all these JavaScript libraries got ported over, but people started doing all this op return good times. So I, you know, I sort of am known for becoming maybe a, a script kitty in the op return era, or, uh, you know, I worked a professional job so I could afford to like throw some money at, at transactions. And, and, uh, and I had the technical know how to do these sort of like publicity feats on BSV. Um, so I kind of worked with the BSV user community to make, I don't know, spectacles, I would say. Like, like what? We talked about putting the Bible on chain. What were some of the other spectacles? That sort of thing, or I don't know, some of the first, uh, like I, I put the first video blog on chain. Uh, what was it? Uh, well, Kevin Pham was doing this thing where he would like post these inspirational uh, Twitter live feeds, live video feeds, and he would like recount uh, the moment and like block height. He'd be like, you know, it is block height, something, something, something. And then he would like leave a message <laughs> to, the, to the present and to the future. And uh, so anyway, so I did a few of those in response to Kevin Pham. And then, and then I uploaded mine to the blockchain and then the Beco Media, a few like blockchain media scrapers would, you know, would present the video to you. And so that really like knocked people's socks off. Uh, we were doing a lot more than that. You know, I mean, Shatters, I think, did the first and then um, Unwriter indexed it as a website. It was some kind of, a, you know, through the looking glass, um, Alice in Wonderland fairy tale, some images and some text. Appropriate. Right. And that kind of uh, opened the door for everybody to just start issuing these like um, we started with data URIs and then we, and then Unwriter sort of defined the Bitcom protocol protocol. Uh, you know, and then it was off to the races from there. And we still use Bitcom today. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. So Alex, did you have questions or can I just keep going here? I have some questions, but if you want to just keep going, I can save mine. No, go ahead then. I'll sprinkle them in. All right. Um, well, let's start with this one. Uh, I would love to ask Derek, what do you think is like potentially the most groundbreaking use case for blockchain? Right. And, uh, and maybe to tie in, this might be the same question, but if you can sort of look into the next five, 10 years for the impact that blockchain will have on the world. Um, what are you most hopeful or um, looking forward to? Uh, I guess I'm not sure, or it, that's a huge question that's hard to predict in the end. Uh, but, but it also seems like it could be something that could be like very bad, but besides it having like all of these amazing potentials, it could have all these like really bad potentials or, there's an analogy I've said a few times where like, it's kind of a morbid analogy, but you know, a shovel is kind of a tool and I can use it to bash your head in and then I can dig a hole six feet deep and I can bury you there. Or I can dig a hole twice as deep and I can access the waters of life and I can sustain a community. And I think like Bitcoin blockchain is like that. Um, I've heard Craig Wright also give that analogy and he says something about houses and maybe his version's less morbid but um but i do think bitcoin could become something like very dark or blockchain if it's useful and it's like if it's enterprise scalable if it's you know if we're not if it's not this incredibly constrained resource with a ton of scarcity then um i don't know okay so maybe we reframe the, the question yeah um because that was pretty doom and gloom and for me, no, no, no. You know, so it doesn't, yeah. So it doesn't, but it doesn't have to be doom and gloom. But it's like, man, can we make sure it's not doom and gloom? 
because it seems like there are people out there that are like, their vision of this seems kind of doom and gloom to me. I don't want it to go their way. I'm in your boat on that one. But blockchain uh, might be this, what I call a Highlander game. So everyone's interested in game theory. And I, I think in game theoretic terms, blockchain is a Highlander game. So, so I say in the end, there can be only one. And, you know, th this is kind of a troll to the game theory community, but, uh, you know, and it's really a movie. Everyone should watch it. Highlander. Uh, in the end, there can be only one. But I do think maybe like, you know, a, a globally scaled blockchain that isn't this like ultra scarce resource. It It is a Highlander game. And in the end, there can be only one. And so, I don't know, in my mind, it's like BSV, it, you know, is the only one intent on scaling in this manner. So it will sort of have the chance of being the only blockchain first. Now, maybe BTC, BTC with all these inscriptions, maybe it's maybe BTC has a, a chance to prevent the rise of BSV in the Highlander game. But but I think it, long term, there will be like the rise of globally scaled blockchains and then the and then the one dominant blockchain will be sort of uh, settled upon. I guess I really got to watch this Highlander movie. I keep hearing about this uh, <laughs> analogy. So I think what we find in like today's economic scenario, right? We find that we're, <clears throat> I mean, many people might call it a multipolar uh, system, but I really call it like a bipolar system. You know, we have the sort of the East and the West here. Do you think there's any chance that that bi bipolar system ends up remaining with two different chains? Yeah, I mean, who's to tell, right? We're uh, even my speculation about a Highlander game is probably like way out there. Um, to me, it sounds really consistent, but, uh, but it probably isn't. Um, and we won't know until it plays out. Right. But yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, symbiosis of a pair or, um, you know, maybe BTC captures like a, some kind of financial corruption and then, um, BSV captures some kind of like data permanence utility or uh, who knows who's to say like how much good or how much evil prevails in, in, in the final system or, or if that's even a, a distinction humans can make. So I would like to know, Derek, what can you tell us about what have you been working on lately? Uh, and has it been anything related to blockchain? Well, um, I've, I've worked in recently in sort of message passing systems or persistent message passing like Kafka style systems or RabbitMQ style systems or Provega was the system I worked on. These kind of systems are inherent to building scalable platforms that, um, you know, message passing is sort of like the, the heart of computing in the end. And, uh, and large systems need to like distribute work by sending messages to each other. And then you need a durable messaging substrate, um, you know, to facilitate this kind of work between within a distributed system. So, um, there's a lot of, I guess, options there, but, and that's maybe where Terranode comes in. Uh, I did read this recent, to like today's press release about Terranode, or I didn't read it, I skimmed it, but it, you know, it looks like they are overviewing the microservices involved and some of the theory behind it. And they talk about like the subtrees of the Merkle root that they shard, like transaction validation according to, or whatever. So um, I, I guess that's kind of, I work on large, software projects uh currently i'm working you know just as a as an independent consultant i had to stand up my own s corporation and so i'm doing corp to corp work recently um in the medical space um uh, but but this like what the capabilities of blockchain are always kind of in the back of my mind in terms of storage massive storage and distributed storage and permanent storage like what blockchain provides us there is really enticing um, and it's not necessarily like a use case or a, you know, a solution begging for a problem so much as it's, uh, it changes the way you think about certain problems. So it's like a new solution domain and people don't really 
fully comprehend the capabilities there yet. Um, so it's got to sort of sink in with people. And, and you can kind of see that, I, I think BSV people are on the cutting edge of sort of absorbing this new way of thinking. But, but then you get into tools like Script or paradigms like um, arbitrary Bitcoin script. And then, it, and then it becomes like really hard, even in BSV land, to sort of imagine the possibilities or take the, those possibilities and then implement your use case. Um, you just need like such a level of expertise and familiarity that you know people haven't really built that up yet. All right, I'll jump back in. Um, Derek, you called uh, BTC being small blocks a, a mass surveillance system. Um, I generally think about it as like economic voyeurism, right? Where everybody just like wants to be able to peer through the right. window. Or that's where when I'm doing publicity stunts, I want to everyone in the world to be able to see it, right? Uh, yeah, so I think you can have a surveillance or self-surveillance or, you know, you can be okay with it and you can operate within that understanding of like, oh, everything's transparent. You, you know, you don't have to live in fear if you're just like, if you know what it is. Yeah, so I'm actually just going to jump to a question I had later on down the line. Um, for those like aha moments, these, uh, maybe you call them zero to one, there wasn't video, now there is, you know, whatever that is, whatever that is or was, if you didn't have to be, you know, working for money right now, what kind of aha moments would you be working towards? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's maybe interesting what you're doing, depending on what you're doing. Uh, there's so much potential in terms of, you know, Bitcoin's, signatures being the basis of a crypto system and uh you know and having arbitrary script plus arbitrary sort of data it's just uh there's so much you could do so if we're just thinking in the medical space like why why wouldn't i be able to um, have some kind of meta net like protocol where my medical records are on chain and i peel off keys for my different providers and they write um, my medical records into my little medical DAG and uh, and I sort of walk around with my with my medical records self-possessed on Bitcoin you know with keys uh, that, that applies that to any record right yeah so for sure anything. Record, and then these are history, sort of standards you could do on any yeah and I, I you know Craig Wright sort of hinted around about like people soft and SAP with his like Walmart post recently but but you know these bills of laden goods and stuff can can be done in that way or you know dht was all about like the container they would they would run the ferries between container ships and the shore to like bring these bills of laden goods on shore or dhl what, one of those package services yeah that's the one dhl uh um, anyway I don't know. so so all kinds of like secure um I don't know, the, the blockchain or Bitcoin can become like an ethernet of sort of secure transmission in, in this sort of data space besides a bunch of um, you know, public exhibitions of data. Yeah, listen, I'm, I'm a big believer that Bitcoin itself can be a truth machine. Uh, I've gotten to the pedantics about what truth means in this case, not that what something, not that what someone wrote on it was factually true, but that they wrote this thing on a given time, you know, with then, a given yeah. block, right? That we can all, you know, technically call the source of truth is, I think, immensely meaningful to building a trusted society in the future. That's a whole different business pitch that I'll give you at some point in time. But the other thing that you said that I wanted to, to um, ask you about is you called yourself a, a script kitty in the, in the days of op return. So what does that mean and what did that feel like? Um, I mean, script kitty is just maybe like a derogatory way of saying, uh, someone who tinkers with like other people's code, but, but there was so much like sharing of code and working of code really like a lot of people know about Shrugger or David Case and, uh, but, 
but you know, we developed these protocols and then there were like, you wanted to send out transactions according to that protocol. And then people were like sharing scripts that, you know, showed how to emit transactions according to that protocol. And so people were just um, reusing each other's tools and, you know, doing different things with it. So, so it sort of started, we were just posting data URIs in clear text. And so, and this is like inefficient way of encoding data. It's like ASCII encoded uh, binary data when, when the transaction itself is like a binary format in the first place. Right. So instead of, instead of encoding data URL, URLs, uh, the B protocol was defined and that was like a B com, a bit com protocol called B for like giving a MIME type and a file name and file contents and that sort of thing. Uh, so B was sort of limited by the size of a single transaction. And then I worked with a few people to develop Bcat, which was, uh, which was like a master transaction that pointed to a bunch of transaction IDs that were your file parts. So it was a way of like splitting the file across transactions and that, and that, so this starts to bring in like the blockchain, Bitcoin's implementation of the blockchain is, can be thought of as like a, a hard drive for the internet and transaction IDs are sectors in that hard drive. Um, and then you can sort of, you can implement file systems in that way on, uh, and so that's kind of what we did. And then, um, and it was sort of who can make the more interesting use cases of that. Right. So Unwriter released a bunch of cool tools. One of them was Bistagram and it would scrape like B and Bcat transactions for that were media that were like known media types. And he just list them like an Instagram feed. And that was pretty cool. Um, there was this chick Amrita and she used some, she like reused, remixed some of Unwriter's tools. And she made like a little chat room that was fed by a faucet. So people could fund the faucet and then like people sitting in the browser window could like choose a username and type text messages to each other. And it was all like written and scraped off chain. And, um, and so she, so she like, she would like, if it became unruly, she would mute, she could mute everybody. But then I like reversed, I reverse engineered her protocols in the way in the wallets that she was tipping to whitelist. And I, uh, and then I started like posting on her chat room while, while she had it muted. Um, you know, it was agents of chaos. Dude. Yeah, agents of chaos out there. I don't know, but it, you know, it was it was just all, everyone were, were doing all these different experiments, and then you know, uh, people were you know plussing each other's experiments. I don't know that's some Disney term, but I get that the plus. Uh, I think it's really interesting that that cat came back um, as a conversation for BTC people this year because of ordinals, right? And they found other ways to do this sort of like, they call it recursion, but I think it would have been much more simple if they could just concatenate some files across a few transactions. And there's still arguments going on about that like right now on- And I think someone has Twitter done an audio like file on BTC across, someone spent like $20,000. Um, One of our friends spent okay, uh, yeah. somewhere around 5,000, Patrick, oh, is that what it was? Uh, Patrick okay. Collins, yeah. He, he did it um, and wrote the code himself to concatenate the previous transactions because, you know, we didn't have the op code. Um, but yeah, it cost him an arm and a leg to put one of his original compositions on BTC. I mean, that's the thing that uh, sort of motivates me and that I think is sort of the killer use case. Um, or, you know, I think it's like a data spam and financial spam. And then I'm okay with both forms of spam. And so, you know, if you want to spam the chain with your mortgage payments and I want to spam the chain with, you know, my uh, genealogy, right, then, you know, we shouldn't really concern ourselves with each other's spam. And you shouldn't have to be concerned with somebody else's spam. Although I'll say genealogy on, on the blockchain gives me kind of the heebie-jeebies a little bit. Uh, you know, and that's where, like... If it's old enough, it's it's kind of like we all want to know. But if it's recent enough, <laughs> then uh, <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> if we think about ourselves as the current block. If it hasn't been settled, then maybe it shouldn't be displayed. <laughs> you know, a few generations back, six six blocks, uh, six confirmations, we can see this. <laughs> right. So here's a question from the comments. Someone asks. 
uh, does the com this is sort of like two questions from uh, their name is BSV is Bitcoin. Does the community or builders inside Bitcoin need a proof of concept before they care to build on it? Slash, why are current TPS results irrelevant? Derek, Zach, any of y'all want to grab that? I think that's directed at the guest first. So. Yeah. I mean, I guess what we don't know our unknown unknowns, but uh, do we need a do we need a proof of concept before we care to build on it? I don't know, man. Or it's hard to know when when does momentum really pick up, or do, do we have momentum back then, or like is it really taking a long time, uh, or are things moving fast? Why are there it, it, yes results? It sounded to me no. like you were. Oh, sorry. oh go ahead. No, I'm just. It, it sounded through. to me like you were describing like the great old age of collaboration. You know, almost almost uh, despondent that you don't see that kind of collaboration today. It's but, maybe it's fair? still there, but it got it got a little boring, or it got professionalized, or like it didn't really get professionalized. But like the Twitch guys picked it up and ran with it, and they didn't make any money. Um, you know that it had. It's always, you know, you're always optimizing price and quantity, I guess. And uh, how, how does to, price and quantity balance with like the contributions people were making and, and building on top of each other? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know if it slowed down, but it. But uh, other people took the reins, and then. Uh, It really depends on what's economically feasible. <laughs> yeah, I get that. We hear that things like, um, even if, if uh, for instance, like Streamanity had all of its videos on chain, that streaming the videos would be so costly that like the site couldn't really make money. So, you know, even some of the stuff that is there and is like historic record on chain, um, if these videos had been put up in that time frame, it may not be able to be served <clears throat> in the way the original authors or publishers had intended. And I think you're right. We're we're sitting at an opportunity moment right now where there's a lot of opportunity to make money in BSV if <clears throat> if people can figure out the right pricing model or uh, customer acquisition model for providing services above what exists right now. But even saying that out loud, I think maybe some of those gaps that I just called a, a profit opportunity, you know, opportunities for people to build companies um, in, in the earlier days might have fil been filled by people who were, you know, just thinking about how to solve these problems and solving them and publishing them open source. I don't see as much of that anymore. Yeah, there was maybe, maybe there was maybe a heyday. Things sort of run run their course, I guess. But um, in my you know in my personal case, it's like I, I you know I'm watching these people having fun staying poor, or I can like keep working for the man and do this stuff as a hobby. And so that's been my choice, I guess. Recently, I mean, um, I'm trying to break out into like more into like compliance, security, and uh, I'm getting involved in like um, armed guards or um, Sort of corporate security, private security. I'm I'm doing a I'm doing an armed guards startup. So I'm starting like a commercial paramilitary, and uh, and I'm also like flirting with implementing sanctions on Bitcoin Core. So I've I have sort of an initial implementation of sanctions, and I want to be like the first per person to like publicly implement sanctions and advocate for like the sanctions PR to be you know to be merged to the Bitcoin decode base. So well, I, what would sanctions mean for Core? Well, even um, as far as I've looked, I think even BSV has implemented their like freeze and release scheme sort of in a way that's not compliant with sanctions. But sanctions, and then there's, there's competing sanctions regimes, but they all sort of sanction Bitcoin one way or another. And then when they do, they list the address that they're sanctioning. And these addresses are sort of looked up during the transaction validation process, but they're in several places, they're like, 
they're looked up and then thrown away or not used. And at those points, that's when you can check against sanctions lists. So all, all the code is actually there. It's just like the function is like um, our input standard or something. And it's like, actually the real question is like, or, or not the real question, but another question besides our input standard, another question is like our input sanctioned. So the code just isn't asking the questions yet, but it's like producing the results that you need to ask the questions. So I've gotten in there and I've like analyzed the code and, and I've got my initial implementation. So you can, you know, the United States Treasury offers a 90 megabyte XML file that contains all of their sanctions. And, and it's really some simple X paths in a, you know, in a loop over this XML file and you can extract like the 376 um, sanctioned Bitcoin addresses one of which is a Tron address. Um, and then you can basically um, consider that your sanctions file, just a text file of, um, you know, Bitcoin addresses and new lines, like, you know, one address per line. And they could be these one addresses or three addresses or BC1 addresses. Um, well, what happened there? So... Uh, an address gets added to the sanctions file, right? Yeah. And so some miners in some jurisdiction know people, that they're not People will be in different jurisdictions. They'll have different sanctions files. You know, different different jurisdictions, sanctions files will overlap, and then those sanctions will be stronger. Um, okay. So in, in practice, right, let's say uh, the United States sanctions North Korea. I think that's a... a you know. Or there's 375 sanctions in play already that the miners are kind of in um, willful and knowingly violating. The, the miners oh, so this is different activists. than a blacklist. Uh, it's a dynamic blacklist in the sense that you're not blacklisting transaction IDs. You're blacklisting addresses that can be used in, out, in the TX in or the TX out. So the, a transaction has two arrays, the TX in array and the TX out array. The TX in array is out point references that point to output scripts in previous transactions. And then the TX out array are new output scripts. And you have to scan both of those for these sanctioned addresses. Right, so uh, let's say I send a transaction to a, a sanctioned address. The miners in the US decide they're not gonna do anything with this transaction because it it's the sanction criteria. They just wouldn't. Yeah, they just wouldn't include it. But then maybe a mining pool in Russia would include it because these are like Russian gangsters. Or, And then so if Russia or someone in Russia wins a block that has these transactions in it, yeah. is the United States then going to build on that block? Perhaps. Or or, well, currently they do, yes. Currently they would. And so a few mining pools have flirted with sanctions and turned them on and off at different times. Mostly, I think all the mining pools have sanctions off right now, but... That might not be true. Uh, F2 pool and Mara pool have maybe been observed sanctioning and not sanctioning intermittently. And uh, but but then like you're like we're saying, uh, miners that violate sanctions will include the transaction, and then FT pool will build on that, or Mara pool will build on that. Uh, so in the code that I've written so far, I have implemented um, check sanctions option and sanction blocks option. And so first you can turn on check sanctions and that will incorporate sanctions into transaction validation. And then you can turn on sanction blocks and that will enforce um, sanctions during new block validation. Um, so so presu presu maybe people wouldn't turn that on at first or maybe people would decide they're their sanctions regime has enough mining power that they can safely turn that on and they can kick out Russian blocks because, you know, the U.S. and European sanctions regime is strong enough, you know, to orphan Russian blocks. So, so maybe they start turning this on. So does participating in a system like this run the risk of forking the chain into multiple jurisdiction chains? Um, only if uh, if Russia would then be like, oh, we're we're going to hard fork against your, you know, if we can, or, or orphaning isn't hard forking, right? So, so if a sanctioned regime becomes powerful enough to orphan other uh, unsanctioned miners, then uh, or sanctions violating miners, 
uh, then then no hard work happens. But if but if the minority people that are constantly getting orphaned want to stop being orphaned, then yeah, they'll have to find some way to fork. Uh, but who cares? I guess uh, <laughs> at that point, like there's this principle in Bitcoin that kind of comes from the early days that like the chain follows hash power or like, um, you know, hash power defines the chain. So, and that was Luke dash junior prevented a hard fork that was, that was happening when like some, some early version of Bitcoin D was released. And the, and the hard, that hard fork was almost ignored under this, like, well, if, you know, if mining power is going to move over to the hard fork then fuck it. But, but actually like Luke dash junior threw up enough signals that miners quit moving over to the hard fork. Uh, and then they patched, you know, they patched the code so it didn't create a hard fork. Um, that's an interesting tidbit of history. Yeah, it was like an accidental hard fork in the node software upgrade. And then one, and then the biggest mining pool was the first to upgrade and Luke noticed the hard fork and Luke got that mining pool to revert. And all the while Gavin was saying like, might makes right, you know, if hash power moves to the fork, then the fork wins. But but also like communication works too, and you know you can get people to back out. But uh, but yeah, if they didn't want to back out, right, and everyone moved over, then like maybe might would have made right, and who cares if it hard forked accidentally? But uh, but anyway, they didn't want that bug to sort of perpetuate, and everyone backed out of that release. Uh, all right, Derek, I want to re sort of uh, word my previous question uh, to try to get like the most optimistic outlook uh, from you. Like, what's the Bitcoin white pill? Give us like the best possible outcome of, of blockchain tech that you can foresee. Damn, I don't know. I mean, it would be cool if uh, if it stayed cheap over the long term. I know everyone wants to become like the new financial elite and so people like sort of um get off on thinking about the one million dollar price valuation but like but if if at least using it can remain some kind of consistent price and and a low price then we can move so many things over to it like i, I can't tell you how many times i've lost like image collections like bitcoin's finally the place you can stop losing things i guess you can lose your private keys and then you're screwed again um but uh but i but it i think it would be cool if like if i could issue my own social media posts and then social media indexers could like pick them up uh you know i don't really want to be using instagram and facebook and uh threads and TikTok and X and uh, what have you. I'd rather just be putting content on chain and and then everybody out there can like remix their different view of it. Uh, so you can do something like that right now on a concept that Alex brought to me that we built uh, right before our hotel locker was built. It's called ordpost.com. Um, you don't need a wallet. It creates a, a a funding key and a signing key for you when you hit the page for the first time. We pay for the transactions when you write a post. They're limited to like a thousand characters, uh, but it's signed by your key and they fit that sort of model that you were describing, right? Where it's described with some metadata and other indexers can pick it up regardless of it, whether or not it came from word post. Yeah, or um... I hey, Derek, to you got to think bigger, man. Yeah, I'm like asking for the best white pill, best optimistic uh, outlook of blockchain technology's impact on the world. And you're giving me an app that like Zach in and our I lifetime? built in like a, a weekend. <laughs> that who built? That Zach built in like 48 hours. It sure hasn't taken off yet. No, I'm saying like. Uh, it has not. <laughs> yeah, owner ownership over your data is is a really cool concept. That's why you know, like I was a part of this idea, and I was like, you know, yeah, we need to make this happen. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess like I feel like if it exists already, it can't be that uh, big of an idea. Well, that uh, yeah, maybe that there's actual traction and that 
that the world moves over to like a global internet hard drive. Uh, that's like a pie in the sky dream right now that, that isn't really achieved and we are kind of operating on Calvin's land. I say that jokingly. I, I'm friends with a lot of the like BTCers and I, I love the way that they troll us. Um, we're maybe a little too sensitive about it. They're really good at it. Yeah, well, and they're, I, it's weird that the space, you know, the space is proud to be degenerate, but that's what it yeah. is. Yeah. So Derek, you really uh, edit or rewrote section 10 of the white paper um, as I pinned to the top. Oh, Can you give us a little go. bit more context about this? Um, yeah, so this is related to my efforts in uh, publicizing my upcoming PR to the Bitcoin D software. Um, I did actually like, so I'm a, I'm a contributor to a piece of software called Inkscape. I helped port Inkscape to C++ in the early days of Inkscape. So it was my first sort of major software contribution before I became a professional software engineer. I'm sort of a self-taught computer guy and, uh, Open source is kind of where I come from. I was sort of, I, I was a little kid in my bedroom, and so I, if I wanted to learn something, I had to pirate that something. So I learned like Novell Netware by pirating it, or I learned like Windows NT pre-release by pirating it, or, um, or I learned Photoshop by pirating it, or I learned you know whatever I wanted to learn. I couldn't pay seven hundred dollars for a software package. Uh, and then I found open source and Linux and it was like, wow, finally I'm like learning and I'm learning faster and I'm not pirating anything. Um, so I'm sort of a product of open source culture and Inkscape was my first big sort of, it gave me the courage to go get professional software jobs when I helped port Inkscape to C++. And I, I specifically focused on like the, the user interface elements of Inkscape. So like toolbars, bu um, buttons, file menus, actions, um, that sort of thing. And I helped to make like, um, I don't know if there's Inkscape users out there, but Inkscape's like highly themable now. And you and I, w I wrote that stuff like sort of 15 years before it was enabled. It took them a long time to like integrate all the code that I wrote for Inkscape. But at like five years, they turned on my toolbars and menus. And then like 10 years later, 15 years later, they were able to turn on like this theming engine that I had built. So now you can like dramatically like redesign all of the GUI layout of, of Inkscape by swapping out like um, widget description XML files. So you can make a dialogue use expander tabs instead of notebook tabs or whatever. And then you can like swap out XML files and relaunch Inkscape and have a totally different user interface. Lay the plane for us. How, how does that uh, relate back to rewriting of section ten in the in the shared post? Oh well, because uh, because I really love graphic software, uh, I like decompiled the PDF and then edited like the the postscript in Inkscape and like added these little arrows. So what I'm showing in my edit is that like um, sources like the SDN. The SDN is the specially designated nationals list, and that's. Um, that's the U.S. Treasury's list of sanctions, and that uh, that list allows you to pierce the veil between identities and transactions in the Bitcoin network. And it's essentially the U.S. Treasury is like doxing bad actors in Bitcoin, right? And so you can take these addresses, and there's a name and an organization there, and and you suddenly know who these people are. So I guess that's what I'm showing there. And this is a this is kind of a spoof or kind of a kind of a hoax or just a way of like visualizing what I'm talking about. There's also been all this like talk about the latex, um, the LaTeX uh, source for the white paper. The white paper ostensibly looks like an open office document, but it may be um, a LaTeX document or um, an encapsulated postscript document that was passed through open office. Anyhow, LaTeX is some kind of a scientific document authoring language. Um, so, uh, so that's I what everybody that's, sees written as uh, L A T E X. LaTeX. Yeah, you might pronounce it LaTeX, but then computer scientists or uh, chemists, people that write published papers, have to encounter this language most journals accept LaTeX files. And so when you 
when you're initiated into authoring a LaTeX file, you're told that it's pronounced LaTeX, but it's spelled LaTeX. All right, let, let's switch gears a little bit here. Uh, I, I know that there was a pretty spicy space happening right before this space started, um, and I think a lot of people from there are, are in here. So um, maybe if it was good enough, we can pick up where you guys left off. But can you tell me where, uh, like, what you guys were talking about in that space? Man, I forget. What was it? I was only in there for like a minute, uh, but it sounded it sounded pretty heated. But that's the way I guess uh, BSV spaces uh, typically are. I've been joining a lot of spaces lately, and it's kind of just uh, open open forum discussions or counter trolling or having a good old time, busting each other's balls or not balls, as it were, as according to each. All right. Well, uh, I think it, it's probably about that time. It's been an hour. Uh, so I'm going to invite some of the people that were in that space. I see already requesting to get up. We might have some questions for you, Derek, or want to continue the conversation. So welcome to the stage, Joe and Tommy. And we will say that uh, in 20 minutes, we do the giveaway. It is a legend, or I think it's legendary. It might be epic, mythic. That's the one. Mythic champions battle card. We've gone with the theme of giving out the frog prints. We're going to continue with that theme. Got a giveaway coming up in 20 minutes. If you haven't already liked and or reposted the space, go ahead and do that now to become eligible. And you might have a frog prints coming your way. Yeah, and I just pinned to make it easy. There's only eight people who have entered so far, so you have a pretty good chance of getting that if you hit the repost button. If you haven't already done so, you got about 10 more minutes before the snapshot so get your repost in and get that nft happy friday joe and tommy thanks again derek for uh spending an hour with us we hope you can spend another hour with us as we move to the audience uh, section of the show so uh yeah, i think i brought joe up first because he's got the blue check mark and we've got a cast <laughs> system and, and twitter now apparently so uh so other than uh, wanting to create a spectacle and be a headache for ocean mining. Uh, why do you think the minor level is appropriate and held responsible for the sanctions? Um, especially like in the, in the BSV model, like where you think of it as the internet, like, are we, are we really going to look at sanctions for passing data packets uh, across the internet? Yeah, as a matter of fact, you have to. Um, it's like standard business practice in America to write these, to write a policy document that, like, I intend to honor, you know, U.S. Treasury sanctions. And you want to have these policy documents on file to protect yourself in case of suit. Like, you can get behind on implementing sanctions, and you you don't want to sort of knowingly violate them. You, uh, American sanctions are kind of, America has some what are called long arm sort of laws and the American sanctions laws are a little bit long arm. They certainly require like all U.S. citizens and all U.S. nationals to like always enforce U.S. sanctions. Like, and most Americans don't know that, but whether you're employed or unemployed, you need to like always know what the sanctions are and enforce those sanctions. Now, none of us do. Uh, but like that's our obligation and should we violate sanctions we will uh go to prison um and, like, that's what they tell you in like sanctions trainings and i've been through like sanctions trainings at two different corporations major corporations and um and they sort of scare you with like hey if you're do if you're the project manager on a pipeline project and you accidentally subcontract to a sanctioned um, entity, then you are personally liable and you are going to prison. So, so actually it's like an Amer, you know, it's an American business responsibility to audit like all of your downline in business and ensure there's no sanctions there. And then, you know, p corporations that are doing international business are very, um, deliberate about auditing those downlines and ensuring, you know, that they don't accidentally rope in sanctioned contractors and their, you know, pipeline projects. But that's like, a, like there's a clear financial contract there. So, that's, I mean, to me, that's a little more understandable. Like, you, YouTube, I guess what I'm saying is, like, YouTube can't stop 
Russian data packets from uh, from being transmitted across the globe, which is what essentially you'd be doing if a miner has to not allow valid transactions passing data across uh, the Bitcoin network to be transmitted. I mean, I think it is a valid interpretation of American law that American miners must not include sanctioned addresses when they produce a new Bitcoin block. They, uh, most of them, I think, do include sanctioned addresses. Like I was saying, some have been detected as not including sanctioned addresses. Uh, there's a guy, one, one Bitcoin developer in particular, is, is, has some weird hexadecimal username. But he's active in the GitHub Bitcoin core project, and, and he w sort of watches for some of this stuff. Um, it's just like it, it is incumbent upon American miners to not include these transactions or else they, you know, are seen under law as like um, sanctions violators. It's in their power, like the software that's been provided to them by the core project doesn't doesn't include this ability. And that's why I'm sort of um, authoring a PR and making some noise about it because the, the facility, the, the feature needs to be in there or some of the mining pools that have turned sanctions off, they justified it in the terms of like it's expensive to to constantly port their sanctions implementation forward to the next version. And then, uh, you know, they wanted to upgrade to the tap to signal to support tap script, right? And then they couldn't port their like sanctions checks over. I think Mara, I think that was Mara pool. They announced that like, okay, we'll turn off sanctions and we'll signal tap script. Uh, so they had some old node implementation they were running that had their private sanctions implementation. And I've seen some of these, there's a, there's like an implementation up on paste bin or something from 2014. Um, that sort of checks against the sanctions file in the way I described. And that doesn't, uh, like in the BSV world and in our idea of the future, that doesn't present a threat to scaling if pre-sanctioned pre node software, uh, all these addresses go out and make so 4 billion, the, 4 billion like, UTXOs. Like that's not a scaling problem to have to validate uh whether they're sanctioned or not, four billion. Not, not particularly. So. Or it's like um, if it comes to the comes down to like the initial block download, that's like a little bit too late to be enforcing sanctions. So like maybe you can never enforce sanctions during the initial block download when you're onlining a new node. But but once that node is online and that node has mining power, and that if that node exists within a sanctions regime, then that node needs to not be emitting blocks that contain transactions that are sanctioned under that jurisdiction or or eventually i mean in that last space matt this matt z character was there and he was talking about power dynamics so like so if if this is the correct interpretation of sanctions and sanctions aren't being enforced and sanctions protesters aren't going to prison then like then yeah no one will implement sanctions but but if the state begins to enforce the law as it exists, then, you know, people will be found like in violation of law. Um, so it's a ma maybe it's a matter of enforcement. It's a matter of like knowing. And then, and that's why I'm, I'm trying to like push the mining community into knowingly violating sanctions and sanctions doesn't actually allow sanctions is like hey sanctions laws when you get trained they're like it doesn't matter if you don't know like this law is written in a way where like not you know unknowingly violating sanctions is the same as knowingly violating sanctions these are like the states of mind in sort of criminal law um anyway there are states of mind greater than negligence and these states of mind greater than negligence are are like knowingly and so I want to move the Bitcoin mining community, uh, you know, into a state of mind greater than negligence. I want them to be knowingly violating so that when enforcement comes, they're, they're, they've been warned. Does that make sense? You Whoa. Must, you must not like Luke very much. I just think, this, you know, if you want to be an activist, you need to be an activist about the right thing. And so if you think... You know, rather than protesting such a monstrous piece of 
legislation, like why don't you go about changing it? Or I've been scared by sanctions trainings. I don't want to scare others, but it's just like, but this is what it is. And, uh, and if it's going to be that, then let it be that. Or, or why don't you guys protest in a more meaningful way and like change these sanctions laws or, or if there's nothing there, then let's get rid of it. Or if there's something there, let's keep it. I think there's something there and probably we should not be, um, allowing sanctioned drug lords and sanctioned terrorists and yeah, it kind of, it kind of came up in my mind actually, uh, from this, there's kind of this idea that marketplaces that allow non non custodial or atomic swaps, like have no liability. And if you actually read their like terms and conditions, like they state as much that they have no liability because it's a tra there's no, uh, there's no, third party custody between the swap and, and whatnot. But I was thinking like the transaction cannot occur without them being there. Like, because they're holding the witness signature and they're the only one that has the witness signature. So they're the only ones that can really uh, filter UTXOs, like whether it's like uh, mixed funds or whatever it is. Like the customer on either end of the trade has no ability to preview like who they're doing business with. They just give their half of the of the anyone can anyone right. can spend. Uh, it just made me think of the kind of the same thing. Like that Magic Eden thinks like they have no liability, or wh whoever thinks they have no liability. But it seems like, uh, especially because I think they're American, that they are going to have liability because they are not custodying funds, but they're responsible for, uh, but yeah, there's some kind of information they have in hand that, I mean, you can pretend to look the other way, but it's like, dude, you got to look. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think people in Bitcoin try to comfort themselves. Like, uh, you know, if you bring up sanctioning addresses and people will be like, Bitcoin doesn't use addresses. And it's like, I mean, these are semantical games and it's like, semantics are important, but like, fine, this isn't an address. It's, uh, you know, yeah. it's a hash. Uh, In a public key hash. Yeah. And then Bitcoin does use hashes. <laughs> do you think, uh, do you think the customer has liability from what you've read about sanctions? Like if, if, uh. Like in that situation, who takes liability for uh, a swap taking place? The customer who did business with uh, UTXOs that they were never presented or the business who who uh, facil facilitated the swap? Or both? Yeah, or... Or like, yeah, if I'm going to do coin joining and I get in, uh, and I get coin joined with, you know, with sanctioned addresses, is is the downline sanctioned now? I don't, you know, uh, I don't know how that washes out. Like, well, I mean, well, I I guess, check? if if uh, if I buy a JPEG uh, from a sanctioned address, well, obviously I had no clue who I was buying it from or what address I would be buying it from. That would be all in business. Would I have? Would I be able to claim ignorance or? You're, you're saying there's no such thing as ignorance for anybody. I would think you might have a claim against the miner. Or that I don't, that I don't know. Or, um, I mean, you're getting at something real specific. It's kind of hard to think about. Why don't you phrase it one more time? <laughs> uh, so like does, as a customer, does the customer have to worry about being sanctioned because they interacted with something that was sanctioned unknowingly? Well, well, not being sanctioned, but being arrested. <laughs> I don't. Well, does this get into like the fungibility of money, or if it's, um, if a store sells product and the money that uh, for that sale was stolen, does the store have to give up like the money in its till? Right. I, sometimes I the answer to, to that is yes, and maybe yeah. sometimes it's no. Or, right. I don't right. know. Um, I've heard of maybe that concept referred to as fungibility. I don't really know what that means. Um, 
You're right. Uh, but, but, you can move on to somebody but, else's question. Well, there might be some responsibility on the sanctions administrators to like to trace and update addresses if they want to. The the mining um, what during transaction validation the the node goes as far back as the the outpoint references in the TX in array. Um, to go back further and further, you'd have to load, you know, from those, those outpoint references point to output scripts that exist in a bunch of TX in arrays, presumably, and then, and then those have their TX out arrays. And you can keep, you can go back like as any number of generations. The, my implementation of sanctions only looks back like one, that one outpoint reference. You know, you're, you're given one transaction, it has one set of outpoint references, only those are scanned. It doesn't go back like n number of generations and scan for sanctions. So, so I don't know if my implementation would be not compliant enough or it's a start, I guess. Courts will have to decide like, no, you got to look back seven generations or no, you got to look back to Genesis. You know, I don't, you know, I don't know. Certainly in the first generation, the, the sanctions apply. Um, but maybe the sanctions administrator needs to update addresses if it gets beyond that or that, or that would be like the current implementation. So, I mean, what you're, what you're asking is like a valid question and it does affect implementation. And my implementation only looks back like one generation of outpoint references. So how far back do you have to look is a question. And then, and then if I'm downline of some sanctioned addresses, am I tainted as a consumer? Like, and it turns out it went through Binance or something and then, oh, but I was using Binance over VPN, kind of like spoofing my identity. And I don't know, or are my, is my Bitcoin now tainted because I'm downstream of some sanctioned addresses or uh, it becomes much more expensive for transaction validation to, you know, to check further and further back. So checking, checking back to only that, that first generation of outpoint references is, is actually cheap and then done redundantly and thrown away each time. So it's like, well, look here, it produced the addresses like four times and threw them away each time. Why don't we like, now I'm just saying we're going to check them once. So anyway, I mean, your question's valid and, uh, and it would affect the correctness of like my implementation, but but I only look back one, one set of outpoint references. So I don't know. I felt like I repeated myself a lot, but like repetition is the key to learning. And these are new concepts. So. All right. We've got a question from the comments. Uh, Ray is asking, what are some of the best practices for someone that wants to run a hobby node or miner? Derek, is that something you want to grab? Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess there's, it's a little easier to do that on on Bitcoin uh, or BTC. You can like even run a, you can run a node on your, on an old iPhone or an, on an old Android phone. Uh, I used to run, I used to have like an Element phone. Element was like the phone company of like the co-founder of Android. And I ran like a BTC node, a pruning node on my element phone. And I used uh, whatever my sprint data plan to, to scarf the blockchain. And it was something like, uh, I forget how much cellular data I was using, but it was like insane. It was like dozens of gigabytes per month or like 120 gigabytes per month or something to, to just like stay in sync with BTC. Um, there's, it's getting harder to run a BSV node because the UTXO set is, is so big. So you need to be able to like, um, get around it, like out of memory errors that people are seeing or, you know, have a very expensive computer to run on. Um, I, I was watching like Twitch try to reload the UTXO set and they were saying that their script to load it kept crashing. Obviously, they had some maybe like uh, naive implementation that was 
causing them to barf on their own memory. But, but I, but I don't know. Just like get in there and do do whatever. Honestly, uh, if that means standing up an ode, like by all means, if that's where your interest is, it's like find your itch and then scratch it. But uh, but don't be afraid of like checking out BTC or my sanctions work. I'm not doing it in the BSV code base. I'm doing it in the BTC code base. Um, and, I, and I may come and like port it to the BSV code base, but they diverged a while ago and they've evolved in their own way. And, and so it's interesting to like see the difference actually. Or uh, I thought it would be like a real quick and easy job to do this implementation of sanctions on BTC, but but actually, and it kind of, the meat of it was, but but there's so much testing in that code base that it's like, I'm kind of swamped in like validating the work that I did. Um, but but it, that also goes for like open source in general. So if like, if Bitcoin is the thing in open source that like really like makes your tummy t tickle or whatever, you feel the Holy Ghost spirit because you think about it. Like, but but it might, I don't know, for me that's been graphics software or email software or all kinds of other stuff. Um, or internet key exchange daemon software. Like I got really into that one time. And that actually ties into Bitcoin again, like really heavily. We can use like the elliptic curve cryptography in Bitcoin to like, to mediate our sort of, um, the IPv6, there's this thing called IPsec in the internet. IPsec is a part of the internet protocol. And uh, we're supposed to be able to turn on IPsec ubiquitously, but the operating system vendors haven't really helped us there. We should be able to turn it on ubiquitously on IPv4, but we haven't. And IPv6 mandates that we turn it on ubiquitously. Um, so like every communication on, on an IPv6 network should be over IPsec and should be kind of vpn into a little private communication. And though, you know, and that's like Bitcoin can tie in right there with our, I, you know, with our IPv6, IPsec privacy it can be based on our, you know, on our Bitcoin wallets if we want. Um, so I don't know, there's, there's a lot of ways to like look at Bitcoin alone or just, or even just like drop Bitcoin and look at open source. Technical skills, I guess, are the key. And so it's like acquire the technical skills and then study Bitcoin. Very well said. Uh, just as a quick announcement, congratulations to uh, Crumbs. You won this week's giveaway. DM Zach to claim your prize. Thanks to everybody who's shared the space so far. That was an inside job. I'm calling it. <laughs> no, just kidding. No, it's funny. I'm, <laughs> that was I'm, an honest, honest draw. <laughs> yeah, for sure. We post a, a verification link so you guys can see. Um, the only time I've ever had to redo uh, it was when it selected myself uh, as the winner. So I'm not going to let myself win. But uh, let's go to Tommy. We've had Tommy on stage for a little bit. Did you have anything to ask or add to the conversation regards to anything that's been stated so far? Yeah, just happy, happy Friday. Happy Tommy. Friday. Happy birthday as well, Alex. Um. Thanks. Yeah, just going back to um, the last space that we we're talking about, and I think you were you were busy, Derek, with um, your work at the time. But um, Matt was talking about we we're talking about scaling Bitcoin, and we we're, we we're talking about Terranode. And then Matt was kind of making the case that even though Terranode is there, um, indexing is still going to be a problem. And he had gone down the route that he'd like to see a different sort of a implementation used for the nodes um, that hold the full blockchain. And you were kind of going with that you you know you preferred the the full blockchain or the full holes i think you're, uh, he was calling it so how would you see indexers scaling on on the way that we do it now on the full holes kind of or i guess um in that sense in um teranode is the indexer Ter teranode's an indexer uh i mean the bitcoin d software is an indexer and it indexes like the chain state and the UTXO set into like a level DB, what's called a level DB. It's a, like a highly optimized key value store database. Um, level DB has since evolved into like rocks DB, but Bitcoin uses like an old fork of level DB. Um, this batch or like any like company that was running an index for, index for before, are all their problems solved? Well, I, I don't. I wouldn't say that, or we don't. 
I mean, we have we're getting descriptions of Terranode, but we're not like getting the code for Terranode. So I, I, I think the bigger like I think the bigger question Tommy's trying to ask is like, is it possible to have interoperable token systems on top? Yeah. of Yeah. Well, I guess what I and what I'm trying to say is, you like the node needs to become a modular software so that it can, so that its indexing capabilities can be extended, sort of almost dynamically or as. Um, as you need or as inventions occur. Um, and, and you kind of need the same modularity in the wallet software, especially if you're gonna like um, deregulate Bitcoin script, which BTC has done in tap script now. And that's what all the inscriptions are about. It's like, they're now finally, they're having like the data appends fun today that we were having five years ago. Uh, because they've like deregulated Bitcoin script and tap script and we in BSV we deregulated Bitcoin script like natively But but in order for me to like invent an arbitrary Bitcoin script and then to implement it. I actually need Everyone's wallet software to load my little plug-in so that it can generate my outputs, right? Because my outputs are going to depend on my arbitrary smart contract and and so it's really hard to do you know Bitcoin smart contracts right now because you can't integrate your transaction templates into the wallet software to get people using your stuff. And that same kind of thing is like in the Bitcoin node, I need to, I need it to be modular enough so that I can like implement indexers or, um, you know, what have you. So, so yeah, if once they release Terra node, you know, maybe there's something there for us to, to be modular enough for, for us to like put the indexers in the node right now, these, the indexers are these appendages that like talk to the node over RPC or they get callbacks from the node as events occur. And then, then the indexers go talk to the node and pull, pull stuff in. Um, so in that sense, like indexers are like microservices that hang off of nodes, but, but if the node can become a collection of microservices, then I can just like add microservices to that collection. So, I mean, it, it, is it a fair summary to say it is economically feasible to monitor the entire chain? I guess for that, not for everybody or for those that run maybe these big right, data for, centers. I mean, mining is already sort of driven into the data center and and it's horizontally scalable. You know, you're, you've got each little piece of mining gear run by an Internet of Things device that talks to us, you know, to a mining pool node. Uh, and so that's, um, but anyway, we need to start seeing the node implementations themselves sort of like spanning across storage pu pools and compute nodes and, um, and that sort of thing. And being, you know, and being modular, we'll just, we'll put our indexes right there in the node software and we'll, you know, we'll have Bitcoin data centers, so, you know, Bitcoin data providers. Okay, so like in short terms, it's about the distribution. Like if you can get the node implementation right, it's just about distribution, then add more machines. Uh, yeah, I guess in the sense of reducing complexity to, to implementing these indexers, you know, they, they have to like live in the ecosystem of whatever Bitcoin RPC right now. But, but, but I guess, you know, they can become more native and we can reduce complexity with in terms of like what what the developer has to deal with in his mental model or her mental model it's it's uh i mean this gets into like computer science theory about problem domains and solution domains and you know a expressiveness of an application programming interface but anyway Oh, that's uh, that's a really good answer to be honest with you. As um, just about Terranode and wanting to see the code for Terranode, and yeah, um, it will be pretty good for people like yourself that'll be able to pick it apart then and and see see stuff with it. So yeah, thanks. I mean, maintaining these indexers is a chore, right? And it's the hard part of running something like Twitch is, uh, you know, scraping the chain. Hey, Derek, I have a question. Um, I was talking to Kurt Walker a while back about 
ASIC miners. And he told me that the data demands of miners, like over the internet, you know, the amount of data that it sends back and forth from the pool and the node is relatively small. Um, and so when you were talking about running a node on your phone and how demanding that was, I was just wondering, Kurt, I'm not sure if you're um, behind the coin geek here, but um, is that right? Is it like, is each miner, each, each ASIC miner, like sending relatively little data back and forth? Yeah. The mining, the mining gear is really only trying to crack the next block header. Um, so it, so yeah, it only needs like most of that block header and that's where like ocean mining pool is trying to work on this, what they call stratum V2 idea of like asking the miner to asking the hash power provider to also run a node and then to provide, not only provide like the knots and the, you know, that, that completes the header that produces the appropriate like leading zero hash. Um, they, they also want the miner to, to produce the Merkle tree root. And this is more like, this is more like trying to evade responsibility for sanctions. It's like, Oh, well, if the miner gives me the Merkle root hash, then I didn't look at the sanctioned addresses. Uh, <laughs> um, anyhow. So is that just uh, BTC Gallywag agree, or is that gonna be <laughs> with respect to their stratum v2? Yeah, it's like another protest. So it's them just trying to protest. trying to trying to avoid the the issue still, right? I mean, it's an aside. They're also an aside from the main question, which I just forgot. They're also like recognizing that now there's seventy five percent hash rate controlled by two three pools very few pools yeah 11 at best um anyway i feel like i deviated from the main topic when we get back onto it what was it the question was the amount of data uh being passed. oh the difference right oh so i was talking about like a a full what they call a full node or a, you know, a pruning node, the actual node software. So I was like communicating with other mempools and, you know, responding to inventory requests. And uh, um, anyway, so the, the actual Bitcoin D software, the actual node implementation is quite a bit different than the mining gear. You know, the mining gear is just um, receiving updates to the block, like block header updates. And then they're, trying to crack, you know, a hash that has the appropriate number of leading zeros. Um, so they update a few variables and then they like see if they struck gold or not. Uh, but, but when you're actually like uh, validating transactions and maintaining a mempool, you're like communicating with all the other nodes and your uh, other nodes are constantly contacting you for what your mempool has and your contacts, you're constantly contacting other nodes for what their mempool has. And, um, you know, so there's a lot more data to transfer to run. So, so the mining pool administrator runs this node, and then the people who might provide hash power, they just run the like the little internet things device, uh, and they talk to the mining pool node. So yeah, so the mining pool node has to do a, a lot of this, um, has to handle all this data, but then the the communication back to the hash power is pretty minimal. And so I guess that's, that's the difference you're talking about. All right. Good stuff. We've been having a great conversation with Derek. As I imagined, it was going to be full of high level insights and 
really good information. So, um, Zach, I'm wondering if you've got any more questions before we go around one more time, just to see if uh, everybody wants to take the conversation into, uh, as traditionally, the after party space starts uh, as soon as the space is over. Zach, not sure uh, if you're going to be opening it up. Yeah, I'll start that. Um, we can go around the questions and, and we'll get that open. All right, let's see. Actually, I think we've got one more uh, speaker requesting to come up. Let's see if they've got a question for Derek or the general speaker panel. Welcome and happy Friday, Impossible Artifacts. How are you? Hey, 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 how we doing? Aloha from Maui. Kind of wouldn't, Aloha. Kind of wouldn't expect them to hear my name, but uh i guess it's a good time to show my project uh in about uh <laughs> nine days it's minting on ords are and uh there's about 20 generations and if you stick bye bye <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's all right got, we could have given him 10 seconds fast to finger show, trigger, bro. i got that fast finger trigger up here that's funny all good, all love, uh, but yeah, we've never seen you here before, so um, maybe next time hang out a little bit before you uh, are so quick to show, but um, it's all love. Anyway, yeah, thanks again for uh, Derek Moore, your time uh, spending with us, really appreciated, and everyone who came up to speak. Uh, if you are in this room right now, I believe you're at the center of the network, so... Uh, I've really enjoyed the space and uh, I'm looking forward to touching some grass this weekend and hugging the people I love and getting some sun. Uh, I recommend that you do the same. But uh, thanks again, everybody, for listening. Appreciate you all. And Zach, I think, uh, is, that, is that it from everyone else on the stage? Tommy? All good. Thanks. All right, yeah. So I'll remind everybody, the weekend, go do some good in the world. We'll open up an after-party space right now. Sweet. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate you being here, Derek. It was great to chat with you. Love listening to it. Controversial or otherwise, it was a great time speaking with you. Thanks. <laughs>